Chris, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for last night. I thought it was uh, very productive. Uh, wasn't too late. People stayed focused. And uh, there were a lot of good questions and a lot of good presentations, too, with the budget. But I'd like to call to order this morning on Friday, May 29th, the 9 a.m. meeting, the Quincy City Council Finance Committee. In accordance with Governor Charlie Baker, Baker's March 10th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the opening meeting law, the Finance Committee of the Quincy City Council is meeting via remote conferencing services that will air on QA TV, Channel 9, Government Access. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Kane. Council Kroll. Council DeBona. Present. Council Harris. Present. Council Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council Palmucci. Council Phelan. Present. Council Chairman McCarthy. Present. Seven members, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to uh, read the open meeting law. <clears throat> Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Um, the matter before us <clears throat> is trying to complete the fiscal 2021 departmental budget hearings. I'd like everybody to try to stay with the 15 minute limitation and then we'll come back. Um, that way we can move the meetings along. Um, I thought the time limits have been pretty good. I don't think anybody's got um, off of that. So I thank you and we will start off by this morning with Mr. Paul Hines with the public buildings budget. Mr. Hines. Good morning, uh, David, good morning. Uh, finance committee members, thank you for having me. I uh, apologize for having to change your schedule around for uh, for my benefit. Um, by and large, as you can see by the budget presentation, the 2021 uh, budget is basically level funded from uh, 2020 with some you know, minor adjustments. Uh, it's actually downwards a slight bit owing to the, the number of pay periods uh, in fiscal 2021. Um, on uh, the year to date report for fiscal 2020 that you have, um, there's some comments I'd like to initially make and then address some other issues. Uh, on the energy line, under um, line 520100, uh, we're at 91% now. Uh, it, I just want to point out it's down a bit because National Grid is lagged in their billing. As we all know, they, they bill a month late. So come July, we'll be paying June bills um so there would appear to be uh, some availability there when in fact there's not um and then um there's two line items that are in uh the department of public buildings budget uh 50 of the costs and 50 percent are shared in the line items of the uh park department budget uh and then the upper in the personal services area and that's number 510 402 the downtown coordinator 512074, the mechanical technician. Uh, those two are positions uh, occupied by the individuals taking care of the Hancock Adams Common. Uh, there's an overage reported on this budget uh, report, the year to date, uh, which is explained to me through the municipal finance department that Munis allotted more of the pay periods for these individuals to in public buildings than it ought to have. They should have been uh, transferred over midway through to the parks department. So my understanding is it'd be a like uh, reduction on the size of the park department for the overages on these lines, but it doesn't affect the bottom line salary uh, wages earned by these individuals uh, and it should not affect the, the bottom line of the city budget. Uh, another line that has have overage is towards the bottom of personnel services. And this frankly is where they all are. There's no other section of the budget where there's overages. Um, and that's near the bottom at line 512-859. And that's the security guard at city and town hall. Uh, mid, mid fiscal year, a pay increase was given to that individual 
uh, owing to the fact that he was then required to carry a gun, uh, his personal gun on premises uh, to execute the duties of his employment. So uh, he was given an, an increase in salary for that. And that's what caused that line. Um, HVAC technician, line 512460, that has uh, about a 15,640 15, overage. Um, that is a line that was, we brought in a new or an additional uh, HVAC technician, uh, someone with experience in the trades and, and maintaining these more sophisticated HVAC systems in our newer buildings and has been quite helpful in, in diagnosing and solving some of the problems in our older buildings. Uh, but the increase in this line item is actually offset uh, by an over, a, uh, a surplus, an apparent surplus in line 512204. We hired the HVAC tech versus a regular maintenance laborer uh, and broke out that position as an individual line in the 512460. Speaking of the maintenance staff, the line 512204, again, there appears to be as, you know, a, uh, an excess in that line. Uh, that's not something I anticipate going forward. That excess is uh, caused by the fact that one of my higher paid employees has been out for several months uh, on workman's compensation. So we have not in fiscal year 2020 paid his salary. He's been paid off the uh, workers' comp account with a lot of payment. Uh, is, our, is our anticipation that it will be returning in the very near future, uh, right at the start of fiscal 2021. So I do need those funds to pay that, uh, that position salary. Um, I believe the last one that's out of line with its budget performance is uh, the first one, the very top of the page under personal services. It's line 512, excuse me, 510, 110. And that's, uh, it says summer, uh, it says salary and wage permanent. Uh, it's an odd name that Munis puts on this. It says wage permanent. It's a, that's in fact our seasonal employees. Um, back in the day, they would have the summer help who would go out and paint the flagpoles and things like that. We've transitioned that. Uh, we've kind of partnered with Massachusetts Maritime Academy and we take in the interns that uh, need to get real world experience for their uh, degree program in HVAC engineering. Um, it's proven to be very beneficial to those cadets that we bring in and certainly to uh, Dave and Paul and Brian in mm -hmm. our HVAC group. Um, they do get uh, a slightly higher salary or wage than those that are out painting flag poles and light poles and stuff in other departments um, because they are towards the end of their college career and it's a more sophisticated and a more beneficial service we get from them. Um, and, and that's where that happened. Uh, I do anticipate having um, a similar experience with uh, having those uh, cadets in this year, uh, particularly this year because a number of their internships uh, in the private sector have dried up because of uh, everybody uh, working from home and office buildings not fully opening and such. Um, so that line item and the two lines immediately below it, which are, uh, excuse me, two and three lines below it, are uh, attendant to um, the, those lines are percentages of, of the overtime and of the summer help lines. Um, the 510, 110 overage can be absorbed by the funding surplus for this fiscal year. That's in 512, 204, the maintenance staff. So that leaves with the, the uh, most significant line, and that is uh, 510, 130, the departmental overtime. Um, that uh, is significantly over. I, I fully acknowledge that. And uh, it realized it was caused by a couple of things. Uh, we have some uh, people that had traditionally not received overtime, which by law should receive overtime from the nature of their employment and their responsibilities. Um, so they are now, their overtime is now charged to that line. Uh, in addition, through you know the support of the mayor and certainly the finance committee and the city council, robust program going on of capital improvements um, that were funded with the capital improvement plan. Um, and as I've suggested to the council and to the committee before, my in-house construction team, as I call them, is actually uh, my cheapest form of labor uh, at, on their overtime. Um, 
and it it saves us you know quite a bit of uh, administrative burden in doing procurement laws uh, and complying with all of that. Um, if, if another aspect of that overtime line is I think you could all anticipate is the time that's been put in owing to the uh, the COVID situation and the shutdowns. You know, our people were essential employees. We didn't go home. I, I certainly didn't st stay home. Um, and we've in the later period of time of all this, uh, been doing the disinfecting of the elder services vans, uh, sharing responsibilities for that with the DPW, uh, the custodians and such have been doing the cleanings and the disinfecting, the heightened cleanings and heightened disinfectants of the public buildings. Um, we've had people in building physical barriers between workstations and public and private areas, uh, public and, and, and staff areas. Um, and just trying to help uh, get the city back on track by opening up the buildings and making them safe for those that uh, work in it and those that certainly have to visit and don't have the option to do telephone or uh, internet services. Um, so that's about what I have to offer uh, as an introduction, as an explanation, and I certainly be uh, here and willing and entertain questions. Thank you. Um Mr. Hines, uh, questions for Mr. Hines. Chair recognizes President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Paul. It's good to see you. Good morning. Thank you. How are you feeling? I, as, uh, I'm doing well. I actually, uh, I haven't taken my pain meds so that I wouldn't be more irreverent than I sometimes tend to be. So uh, I'll be popping a couple after this, but I, I'm doing okay. Good, good. Well, um, I have just two questions for you. So the first is um, with respect to the salary for the interns and for the summer help. And so I know this summer, obviously for fiscal year 21, things are pretty much up in the air depending on when, um, you know, folks will feel comfortable sort of coming back out. But do you feel even like, if, even under those circumstances, I think this is an incredible program. I think it's a, a really great asset for the kids um, in the city. Do you think that 25,000 is enough to cover um, what activity you think you'll get this summer? Um, I, th I think it is. Um... You know, everything's level funded. Uh, they are more expensive. Two of them have advanced in years uh, in their program. Um, we have begun the conversations about engaging them. They haven't made a salary offer. I'm going to suggest them would be level funded over last year. Uh, and I'm kind of have the upper hand on it because they are they are somewhat desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't want to take advantage of them. But um, they do do good work. They're very helpful. Um, the older of the ones that did it last year wrote an incredible report back to the school as they need to do about the experience they received. Um, you know, I, I, I think I can, I could do it with the 25,000. And, and if it works that I'm, I don't, um, I think I, I can reallocate within this, uh, five, the 251 section. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if okay. the time comes. Great. Um, keep us posted on that. I'd love to hear more about the program and as it grows in, in the coming years. Um, mm -hmm. The second and last question that I have for you is line item. I'm going to give you the number because the names that are listed in the budget book and the names that are listed um, on the actuals to date are different, but it's the line item 512338. So in okay. the actuals, I have it as a labor or gardener, but then in the budget book, um, I have it as, um, oh no, wait, labor or gardener, but then oh, it's the, um, the year to dates. Yeah. The historical actuals. I'm sorry. It was listed as handyman, but in here it's listed as labor gardener. Yeah. Uh, they changed it up. I don't see anything being spent in that line for the last for the last fiscal years from 17 upwards. Right, that's a position that for some reason it's it's here and I, honestly I'd have to ask Eric to step in on this one. My understanding is it's involved with the downtown uh, crew and not my department. Um, and that's why the, the overage in the mechanical technician uh, line for fiscal 2020 is gonna be absorbed by that, that line 512-338 it's associated with that downtown operation. Uh, so I don't really um, have the particulars on it. I would ask, you know, again, that uh, Eric step up on that one. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Uh, through you, Chairman, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss that. Um, well, first off, good morning, counselors. That feels really weird to say. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, the other half of that cut that was made to public buildings. Um, oh, sorry, to uh, parks last, uh, last night. Um, it is a little weird because it's the same object code, but has a different account description. Uh, so in, in Mr. Hines' budget this year, uh, that handyman with that original, that salary that should have been charged to that line got charged to that mechanical technician line. That's why it was over budgeted. 
why it got increased year over year, despite it being the same number of people. So that 34,000, similar to the 34,000 that was cut out of the same object code in parks last night, can be cut out of this budget this year. Okay. <clears throat> so, but it, it, I just want to make sure, though, that the work um, being done, similar to last night, is being covered under the overage for the mechanical technician, right? And then just moving forward, just for these things, you know what I mean? Like if we can, and I think Councilor Mahoney had mentioned it last night, if we could just be a little bit more mindful about um, how it's being printed and how it's being showed to us, just because these are things that I know all my colleagues go through at the fine tooth comb, and I certainly don't want it to come across like it's a mistake on anyone's part. And so, you know, things happen. I totally understand. Like I do plain and typos in my day, but just moving forward, I think it'd be helpful for everyone to better understand the book um, if those line items could be um, done better. So, uh, with that, Eric, thank you so much. And um, if, I, if I may, yeah. Um, following on your your first question of of the the summer help in the mass maritime interns, this would be a source this line if it remained. Um, that could supplement that line in that program if need be. Okay, I, I mean, I don't doubt that that's the case. Um, I think, you know, to answer your earlier question, it sounds like there's another area where you can pull that from. Uh, okay. And I think, you know, given how high the overage is, I would feel more comfortable cutting it. Um, okay. Especially if, you know, given the conversations that were had, if it's an overage that shouldn't have been there in the first place. But okay. um, I appreciate that, Paul, thank you. So Mr. Okay. Chairman, with that, I'd like to make a motion to cut um, 34,000 from line item 512338. Okay, there's a motion out. Um, just uh, on the motion myself, uh, I received Eric's uh, memo, but I got it late. Um, and we were already uh, kind of uh, in the works here last night. So uh, my apologies. Uh, I know Jen uh, sent it out this morning. I hope a lot of folks got it and got a chance to look at it, but it was pretty, um, self-explanatory when you looked at the memo. Uh, uh, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I didn't get a chance to see it. Yeah, it, we, we shot it out, but yeah. it's um, it's pretty clear. And um, uh, on that, uh, on the motion, does anybody have uh, any comments? So we're going to cut 34,000. The line, uh, I'm looking at 512338. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, also, could I um, get a motion to adjust that line uh, from someone so we could um, make the adjustment in the department right now? Motion to accept as amended. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Kane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Councilor. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Uh, I'd say enjoy your afternoon, but <laughs> uh, enjoy your weekend anyways. It looks like it'll be nice out. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for your support through the year as well. Did he recovered? Did anyone have any other questions for Mr. Hines? No. We're all set. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Okay. That was easy. Um, next up is um, Mr. Mulvey in the education budget. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Good morning. Good morning, counselors. And I want to thank you for inviting myself and the superintendent, Mr. Mullaney, to present the uh, budget to you for FY 2021. Um, I, before I begin, I, I do want to thank, um, obviously, the mayor uh, and the school committee for giving us a fantastic budget this year. Um, I do want to point out first off that even though we are in the middle of a COVID-19 epidemic and the ensuing um, crisis, we this year through in the FY21 budget do not have any layoffs, which is fantastic. Um, in fact, we are building as you'll see um, through the budget presentation that we present to you today. But Again, that's a, that's a big thank you to the mayor and to the school committee for their support. And of course, I do want to thank you, the city council, for your support year in and year out uh, with regard to the school budget. Without your support, obviously what we do here in the Quincy Public Schools could not be done. And so a, a great uh, thanks is owed to you. Um, and lastly, um, well, one more, I, I do want to thank the SLT, uh, particularly Jim Mullaney for assisting in putting this budget together. Um, again, everything is uh, very detailed and as usual, Mr. Mullaney did an excellent job with, with regard to putting the numbers together. 
And lastly, I want to uh, thank the superintendent. Um, this will be his last budget presentation before the city council in regard to the Quincy Public Schools. Um, and, uh, you know, as always, uh, he is a, uh, you know, a great leader for the Quincy Public Schools. And I just want to thank him uh, and everything that he's done for the school department. And I know that you'll be in agreement with me uh, in that thanks. Um, so with that, uh, we'll move forward with the uh, budget presentation. Um, as you'll see, Jim, Mr. Mullaney and I will go back and forth into the screen. We thought this was the easiest way to do it. Also, we'll be maintaining safe distances for COVID-19 purposes, but you'll be seeing myself and Mr. Mullaney going back and forth in front of the screen so that we can give you an efficient presentation. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Mr. Mullaney to enter the screen now. Thank you. Good morning, counselors. Uh, thank, uh, thank you again for all your support. I'll just get right into it. Uh, the budget uh, you have before you for the year is $117,385,590. It's a $1.97 million increase over our previous budget. And the funding this year comes from three main sources. Uh, the mayor's appropriation of $111,185,590, a million dollar increase uh, from the fiscal year 20 budget. Uh, which includes uh, the <coughs> money that comes from the state. Projected circuit break of funding, this is a reimbursement for special education tuitions and other expenses of $5.2 million. And the CARES uh, Elementary, Secondary and Elementary School Relief Fund, uh, we were awarded uh, $2,030,000. We're using $1 million uh, for our, uh, continuing operations to prevent any layoffs and we're saving a million dollars to roll forward into the next year. Uh, as usual, we started our breakdown to look at see what we'd need uh, to maintain a level budget. So we added in our negotiated increases, subtracted out uh, for the items I mentioned before, the circuit breaker and the cares. And once again, the mayor is being gracious enough uh, to let us use our breakage. We're estimating 12 retirements uh, worth about uh, $40,000 a year in savings, so that's uh, $480,000. We came up with a uh, budget figure of $110 million to maintain level services. The appropriation is $111,185,590. So this leaves us seven, uh, $780,000 uh, to build our budget on. And as again, I said, uh, meets all our contractual ob obligations to step in level raises provides additional funding uh, to meet class size, academic programs, academic support, academic expenses, and non-academic expenses. I'm just gonna turn it over to Mulvey uh, regarding our process. Thank you, Mr. Mullaney. And I'll just quickly go through how the budget process um, is uh, done here in the Quincy Public Schools. Um, and I'll just go through it very quickly. First, we identify areas of consideration we review organized options to address possible areas of impact. That's usually done with the superintendent and superintendent's leadership team as it was done this year. We prioritize possible areas of increase, shift, and reduction. We determine the impact on budget area and lines um, throughout the entire budget. And this is done through feedback, um, again, through the SLT. We present options to the Quincy School Committee, which we did uh, last Wednesday. Uh, we prioritize options uh, pursuant to the wishes of the Quincy School Committee. We re rework those options if necessary, and then act on those options. Uh, we also, as we're doing today, present to the Quincy City Council um, for your review as well. And next you'll see, um, just at a glance, a um, chart which shows our budget priorities. And you notice at the center of the, of the budget priorities um, are our students, and then we work our way out from there. So we always wanna make sure whatever we do, we're doing it for the best uh, interests of our students. And you'll see it goes out to, from there, it goes out to academic classroom teachers, academic programs, academic support, non-academic support, subsidized programs, academic expenses, and non-academic expenses. And we'll go through each one of these for you. And uh, Mr. Mullaney will be back to, to go through the, uh, the numbers on each of these priorities. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yes, President. Uh, I just wanted to really quickly share that I can share the presentation on the screen um, if it's all right with you guys. And that way we're not just, you know, folks who are paying attention or watching from home don't just have to look at the screen. If you guys are okay with that, I can share the presentation that we have um, printed out for us. 
That's all. Sure. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Counselor. I believe the next slide would be great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is our academic classroom teachers. Uh, we're looking at increasing 2.5 positions. Uh, one academic classroom teacher uh, to support EL students, English language learners, students at the high school. And uh, 1.5 academic classroom teachers to address class size needs. Uh, we're estimating that to be uh, about 82,500. So in total, we're increasing academic classroom teachers $137,500. Go to the next slide. Uh, we're looking at our academic programs. Uh, we've addressed a lot of areas here. We're increasing a, uh, another ELL teacher at the high school level. We're having two literacy teachers uh, for early intervention in math and literacy. Uh, increasing two special education teachers for language development classes in elementary and middle schools. An increase of one special education teacher for Orton Gillingham. An increase of one special education teacher for the CARES classes. And a uh, increase of one uh, speech therapist. So in total, that's eight positions for $440,000. Moving on, we go to our academic support. Uh, we're increasing uh, guidance staff for social and emotional programs uh, by one position. Uh, we're increasing a uh, one our IT support by one position, and half of this is going to be funded through the Mayor's CARES money, uh, the COVID um, Relief Act, uh, for the half the year, and we'll be picking up for the second half. So and this is a tech manager. As you know, uh, our budget doesn't show everything that we have for expenses, including health insurance and what have you, but even beyond that, the mayor is, uh, per is purchasing through the CARES Fund 7,000 uh, Chromebooks for our students, as well as 1,000 laptops for our teachers. This tech person will be able to repair and maintain and keep those updated. So that's in there for half a year's salary, but it's a full position. And we're also increasing cent central office administration by uh, one position. Uh, that's uh, for uh, needs. We've been looking at this for several years. This should help out with Edival and professional development. So that's a total of three positions for $210,000. Moving on, we're not looking at any changes in non-academic support. We're not looking for any changes in academic expenses. And in the final slide for non-academic expenses, we're reducing gasoline to shift funding to professional expenses by $7,479. So if you look on uh, slide 13, we have a summary of uh, all what I just went over. Uh, with the new money, uh, we're looking at 13.5 positions for a total of 780,021, that amount I mentioned before. And then the total breakdown uh, to the right of that, it has uh, the contractual raises for step and level for professional staff, which uh, represents the increase of $1,976,021. Uh, of which one million is coming from the CARES Fund and the remainder of the 976,021 is that increase in our budget uh, that the mayor has proposed. Thank you. And lastly, you'll see the, the final uh, slide is again, the priorities at a glance and it just basically breaks down for you percentage wise um, in regard to the new money where, where it's going. So as you can see under academic classroom teachers, 17.63% under academic programs, it's 56.21%. Under academic support, it's 26.92%. Under non-academic support, there are no change. Subsidized programs, no change. Academic expenses, no change. Under non-academic expenses, you'll see a negative 0.96%, and that's reflective of the move um, of the approximate $7,000 in gas funding into, into staffing. So at a glance, essentially, that is, um, how our new money is being spent, and that is essentially our budget proposal as presented. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you, um, Mr. Mulvey and Mr. Mullaney. As usual, uh, you know, the school department, and I know a lot of us here are familiar with it, is uh, 
very organized and um, always <laughs> have the right priorities at the forefront. So thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Mullaney or chair recognizes uh, Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to start off by saying, uh, Dr. DeCristofaro, um, thank you for your entire career over uh, being superintendent, working with me while I was on the school committee. Um, I enjoyed the Sunday afternoons at Coddington Hall, um, um, and I am looking forward to the new um, and interim Kevin Mulvey doing a great job as well as being over there. Um, you know, I, I just looking back at this um, at this particular year, and you guys have done done a great job with the with the different programs uh, on Zoom and the classroom participation. Um, some of the biggest things I was kind of looking forward to is um, is how how do we teach for the future? Um, looking more of of the budget for twenty one, um, and it's been great because. The, the mayor and, and the administration, and we've built a lot of new schools over the last nine years. We, we've had three new schools that have built more space and square footage, but looking forward to trying to get back to school in September, um, would it be a problem with classroom sizes? For instance, if we had 20 in a classroom and they started imposing these social distancing type of guidelines, um, do we have enough space in our schools to to maintain that um, type of um, space? I guess I could say square footage. And do we have a type of, um, I guess, a plan to maybe try to try to mitigate that when when the time comes? Um, it's been a question that's been asked about, and it has a lot to do with our budget. If do we have enough room size in the classrooms? Do we use a lot of the cafeteria space, gym space? Um, do we do we look forward to getting St. Mary's up and running a little faster than we thought? Um, is the new acquisition for our special education on Old Colony going to help? And, and do we have to speed up that process? So I know it's a lot I asked you, but um, it's something to think about with our budget and how we're going to budget out things. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mulvey, if you could or... Anyone else? Sure, and, and, and I, the superintendent may want to weigh in on this as well. Um, but all of those factors are going to be um, considered. Um, it's our intention, obviously, to um, work with the school committee and work with guidance from DZ with regard to what they call phase four reentry. Our hope is that we will be able to do that. But nevertheless, we are going to we will have uh, a plan in place in case reentry is not possible. Um, and we will see whether or not there'll be a, you know, it's a combination of, uh, re-entry and remote learning. Um, so, you know, all of these factors are going to be considered with regard to how we proceed moving forward in September, but even prior to September, we are in the process currently right now of putting together a very rigorous, uh, remote learning summer program, both for our regular education students and our special education students. I think at current um, check, uh, we have over 700 regular elementary um, children signed up, students signed up for our rigorous summer program. And I believe we're closing in on 100 special education students. So we're gonna we're working on this uh, from the get go. We, we haven't um, stopped developing plans from the beginning of this crisis. Um, so the first step is getting this uh, summer program in place so that we can make up any losses that may have been incurred um, for students uh, during the regular year, making them up over the summer. And then we will most likely put together a, um, a task force or a team with all the stakeholders, including parent groups, uh, to take a look at over the summer um, what our options are with regard to returning in September. And of course, we'll be looking to the state, to DZ, and to the governor's office to give us the parameters uh, you know, within which we can work. Um, are we going to be working totally remotely? Are we going to be returning? Are we going to be doing a hybrid of one or the other? All of those will be considerations. And of course, the school committee will have a significant uh, voice, obviously, along with all the stakeholders, parent groups in that process. So right now, um, we don't have a definitive answer for you as to what September is going to look like, but I can tell you we will have a plan 
and it will be effective. And our goal, as, as um, I said in the um, budget presentation, is making, keeping our focus on our priority, which is our students and our families, and making sure whatever decisions we make, they're at the center of our decisions, and that um, whatever program we need to put together, which we will have ready, uh, will, may, will benefit them um, to the most extent possible. Thank you, um, Mr. Um, Mulvey. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see that you got some special education teachers, Norton Gillingham, um, also special education in the CARES class and speech therapy therapist teachers. So, thanking you for you know putting in these these new um, teachers, um, specialists to put in our schools to help out our children. Um, just just overall, um, you guys are doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Real quick. Um, the last five years, we had a, um, an increase in, in, um, in contractually, um, a 1%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 3%. 2 Where are we now? Or is there new, is there new um, deliberations on, on a contract or what, what's going on? So on that issue, we have 10 unions on the school side that we negotiate with. Uh, we are... Um, Prior to the COVID-19 crisis occurring, we were in the process of gearing up to begin those negotiations. Yep. As of right now, um, the con for our non-professional staff, almost all of our contracts end on June 30th. For our professional yep. staff, the contract ends on August 31st. Um, it's our intention to move forward with those negotiations um, as quickly as possible. Um, yep. Obviously, we have to um, work within the parameters of the COVID-19 regulations. Um, but I am in constant communication with all of our unions and union presidents, um, and we're hoping that we can get that back online as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your time and all your hard work. We're looking forward to the future, and I know you guys got your pulse on it. So thank you so much for your time. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Chair recognizes Councillor Mahoney. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Malvi, and congratulations on your interim position. And I just wanted to also congratulate Dr. Christopharo um, as your last your last budget meeting. Um, but you're going to probably be moving right on to another bigger um, <laughs> challenge. And um, I'm just curious to know if Kevin's going to change that chart because you know you probably thought you were you know that chart's been around for a while. So it's a good one though. Um, I do I do have some concerns. Obviously, just um, going forward, Kevin, this is going to be um, a challenging time. Obviously, we're here taking over with COVID-19. Um, I know um, Councilor Devona mentioned a few things, but also like buses and transportation. Um, those types of things are very concerning to me because I, I do believe that sometimes when we use the buses, they're using multiple schools and it's just, there's a lot of intricacy that goes on to how you're gonna be able to manage bringing back our students into the buildings. And, you know, your budget covers the most important thing, which is the teachers and the education. But my concern is how we're gonna be able to manage that phase four. Um, it's not included in your budget, uh, some of the phasing and, and some of the additional things, with the exception of maybe some of the Chromebooks. Is that true? What we've um, actually received, so with regard to our buses, our focus obviously on our buses, uh, you know, obviously making sure that we transport our students as safely as possible. We'll be looking at CDC guidelines on that as well as Department of um, Public Health guidelines with regard to the distance that we have to maintain for students on the buses and we'll certainly make efforts to do that. Um, the other focus with regard to transportation would be the sanitization and cleaning of the buses every time it's used to make sure that, um, you, know, every, you know, every time there is a trip, there is a sanit sanitization process done. Fortunately, the mayor has, through the CARES um, Act, um, allowed us to purchase a significant uh, amount of um, PPE, personal protective equipment, that also includes um, uh, sanitization equipment, including um, echo sprayers, uh, which are used to actually spray uh, relatively quickly the buses down so that it immediately disinfects um, the area. Um, they've, we've also been able to purchase um, a significant amount of uh, gloves and masks and um, even goggles for some of us staff that would have to, you know, have use of that, that equipment. 
Uh, again, the, the mayor has been very generous with regard to our need in, pre in preparing for a potential uh, phase four reentry. Uh, and we are in good shape with regard to, through the CARES Act and funding to the CARES Act, with regard to purchasing all of this PPE equipment, as well as all of the sanitization equipment that we would need in order to make sure that our students are transported safely, as well as main making sure that our staff is safe as well. Yeah, and the other question that I had is, um, obviously, we don't know. I mean, we, we're, our plans are that we're going to be back in classrooms in September, and um, and you know, there's there's all mixed messaging as to you know what could happen in the fall, and I know that this kind of was um, none of us were pre as prepared as you can be. None of us were really prepared for the drastic changes that we all had gone through, and um, the online training that that got up and running, um, took a couple of weeks to do it, but it, it, it did. It's a lot of, it's a, I, I find all the reading I'm doing, it's a big challenge for students because they've never done the online before. Are, are you seeing any issues with that or any um, any way that you're gonna be able to, because we you were doing pass fail and you're probably gonna have to move into grades. We can't do pass fail forever. So I'm just curious to know how you're gonna be able to handle that. And I know this this is my last question. I just, it's just because it's a concern for a lot of people, it goes along with the budget too. No, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, as since this crisis occurred on May 14th, we've been ramping up our efforts to increase the rigor for our students. Um, so the next step, as I had mentioned to Mr. DeBoner, is that we're having a very rigorous summer program. Now we have over 700 general education kids. We're closing in on 100 uh, special education students. So this is going to be a real test for us with regard to how, and, and we have a significant amount of um, buy-in by the teachers union and the teachers who have already um, agreed to participate in large numbers in, in this summer program. So this summer program will be really be a, a test for us with regard to increasing the rigor, uh, increasing the amount of time, a virtual time, one-on-one -on -one time between teachers and their students and um, Aaron Perkins and Maddie Roy and other members of the SLT have been doing a fantastic job with regard to developing this program. The program itself will be reviewed next uh, Wednesday at school committee. Um, we're tightening up all the details but we are um, going to certainly increase the rigor uh, for our students and again if in fact the state says that we can't come back and we have to continue remote learning this will be an excellent way for us to uh, hone our skills in that area and then hopefully um, move as smoothly as possible into uh, remote learning if we have to in September. Mm -hmm. Obviously, everyone wants to get back. I certainly want to get back. I, I think everyone wants to get back and we're hoping to do that. Um, and we will be prepared if, it is, if there are a return, particularly dealing with um, issues where we may have some staff members who are in the high risk category uh, we'll, we'll make preparations in order to find appropriate coverage for those staff members so that if they can't return, we will have highly qualified staff to continue the education of our students in their place. So there's a number of different factors that we're considering. And again, um, our work over the summer and dealing with all the stakeholders involved will help us develop those plans as we move forward and as we get guidance from the state um, again, with regard to the parameters in which we'll be working. Well, I appreciate the update. I do, I, I, I do just want to stress that it's very challenging for many, um, you know, wh whether it's private businesses or small businesses, but really for the educational world, it's a very challenge, especially public education, because you really have to give everybody a fair opportunity. Well, the last question that I had, I know that you said that the mayor, um, the mayor funded 700 Chromebooks and a thousand um, computers for teachers. Is that what was said? It's actually seven thousand Chromebooks, believe it or not, and okay. one thousand um, laptops. So a total of eight thousand pieces of equipment that will be used in the event. Again, if we have to continue remote learning, those pieces of equipment will actually hopefully be in so that we can use them uh, if necessary for our summer program. So far, we've already handed out to students in excess of 1,300 Chromebooks mm -hmm. um, and we'll be handing out more as uh, the seniors uh, sign out. They'll be turning in their Chromebooks. Those Chromebooks will be wiped clean, sanitized, and be prepared to be distributed to other students over the summer and for next year. Uh, so we're, we're thanks to the mayor and the, and the CARES money, 
we will be in very good shape with regard to maintaining and expanding, if necessary, our remote learning. So that seven thousand, um, that will be enough for your full for all students, to be able to have a Chromebook next year, potentially, correct? We believe it will be yes, and because we have approximately somewhere between thirteen hundred Chromebooks, thirteen hundred and fourteen hundred, perhaps as many as fifteen hundred Chromebooks at the moment. So that in combination with the thousand, seven thousand, we'll be getting sometime in I think early July. Um, we should be good. The last question that I had, and and, um, and this will wrap it up. The other thing that can be very challenging for online um, learners is how the teachers are communicating. So the assumption is that all teachers have a computer at home too, but will the teachers be supplied a computer? You said 1,000 for teachers, but will the teach because if they're not on the same technology, sometimes it's um, harder to translate that. Correct. And, yeah. um, I do have a, I, I have a little bit of knowledge because I have a, I have a teacher in my house that's teaching online as well. So it's just kind of a interesting, it's an that's interesting, great. even for myself to listen to the classroom go on. It's, um, it's mm -hmm. he's teaching illustration. So I don't know how he's doing that, but, but I'm just asking that question because it, because it's important that, um, that, you know, that, that the teachers are also equipped if they're having to do remote learning. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a good point. That's why we, um, we have the thousand laptops mm -hmm. where, um, where uh, it's our anticipation that any staff member that needs a laptop or wishes to have a school laptop because of this thousand coming online will have access to that. Yeah. Um, so we have approximately 850 teachers in the district at the moment. Um, so we feel that the thousand laptops that are coming in will certainly cover uh, our teachers' needs and we'll have a reserve in case uh, a paraprofessional may need it or a speech therapist may need it or a behavioral analyst may need it. Um, or you know, also to cover any breakdown in computers, one can be handed in while the tech fixes that computer and another can be handed out. Yeah. Um, so there is no gap in uh, technology. And that, that was the idea of um, getting a thousand for the staff in yeah. laptops. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the information. And again, congratulations to both of you. And I look forward to working with both of you in different capacities now. So thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Chair recognizes uh, Councillor Kroll and then Councillor Palmucci. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dr. D, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you for, uh, for your advocacy on behalf of Quincy Public Schools, um, you know, for a very long time. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you. And I know you'll do, uh, you'll do a good job where you're going. And i um, excited to work with you, Mr. Mulvey, in, in your uh, interim post. I, uh, some stuff was covered here uh, this morning that I had some curiosity around, particularly the logistics. So I want to thank Council. Oh, did we lose him? Yeah, I think he's frozen. Can't hear him. No. Come on back, Councillor Kroll. Try to suggest you move on. Yeah. Okay. I'll go to Councillor Palmucci and come back to Councillor Kroll. Council Unfortunately, Palmucci. my microphone is working fine today. Excellent. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, I uh, want to add to the chorus of uh, congratulations and, and well wishes to Dr. Chris Faro. Done an mm -hmm. incredible job. Um, thank you for your service to the city of Quincy. I don't think uh, uh, every department head loves their department, but um, man, you, you, you know, you live it, breathe it, bleed it. It's, and it's so clear from all of your actions that I've experienced over the last 10 years. So can't thank you enough. Thank um, you. You know, bring on the, the Mulvey era. Uh, I trust it'll be just as successful and, you know, hopefully fingers crossed, it'll be uh, a nice long tenure uh, in the position. Uh, but I just wanted to ask, um, Mr. Mulvey, about the um, um, the free lunch and breakfast programs. Um, how I talked to uh, Dr. DeCristofaro uh, pretty early on about this uh, to get a sense, and I haven't checked in with him. But what, where do we stand with how those are going in terms of participation? And I know that um, again, pretty early on, you guys had expanded the locations from which you were. Um, uh, dispensing or dispersing food for for um for students 
and the reason I ask, I think it's, it's obvious, um, the, you know, times of crisis, the folks who live in poverty or the working poor are often hit the hardest. And I think this crisis is no different. We've seen statistics of the people who are getting sick and the people who are having the hardest time economically. Um, and, uh, Absolutely. I just want to make sure that, and I trust that you guys are, I just want to check in on it as to what we're doing to make sure that kids don't fall even further behind on on such important issues like you know health and nutrition sure so um with regard to the food service program we got that up and running almost immediately um and i do have to thank our food service director sarah dufour and and her team because she does a fantastic job with regard to coordinating all of this i think to date or at least as of wednesday we have served sixty-five thousand lunches and sixty-five thousand breakfasts Wow. to all of our students and as of today it's more because it's continuing um, initially uh, we, and we've been expanding the program um, since it opened um, but now um, we are um, serving regularly a large amount of people that's 65,000 breakfasts and lunch lunches will just kind of give you an idea of how many families in Quincy are in need of this program and that's our intention to continue this as well as continue this through the summertime um, so that our most vulnerable families are served and that they get the food that they need uh, moving forward. So we have every intention of making sure that um, the program continues. I do want to thank also the Food Service Union, uh, who I've worked hand in hand with, along with Sarah Dufour and the superintendent. Um, they have been just fantastic because, as you know, under the COVID-19 regulations, uh, you know, they're, they're not necessarily obligated to, um, you know, come to work. They could have, um, you know, used any number of COVID FMLA related reasons to stay home, but they didn't. Uh, they knew that our students uh, needed needed this food in their families. Um, and heroically, they came in and worked every day. Obviously, we made sure they had all of their proper PPE, uh, but nevertheless, they worked heroically to make sure day in and day out our kids would serve their food even on uh, holidays like uh, Memorial Day and, um, and Patriots Day, they, they came in when they were supposed to have a day off. They, they came in and they served our students. And because of that, um, we, you know, we've made sure that um, you know, to the best of our ability, no one has fallen through the cracks and students that need food are getting the food that they need. That's terrific. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, do, do you, do you have any sense of whether or not people are falling through the cracks in terms of how many how many meals we're giving out prior to COVID and then subsequent to COVID? I mean, are there kids who aren't making it to the school to get the meals in, in any large numbers, or is it difficult to, to track? Yeah, no. So fortunately, through our guidance staff, and again, there's just so many people involved in the caring for our families. So our guidance staff, our health and wellness staff, they're in constant communication with our families and our students. So if in fact, so that we have multiple layers here to make sure that uh, no student, no family is falling through the cracks if they need assistance, not just food assistance, but other assistance as well. Mm -hmm. um, health and wellness assistance just in general. Um, but we are in constant communication with our families. If for instance, a family for whatever reason can't make it to get food, we'll bring food to them. Um, and we have uh, resources to make that happen. Um, so, you know, obviously it's a, it's a constant work in progress. And um, as of right now, we I believe we're serving our students and families to the best of our ability. And we've put in place multiple levels um, of student contact and engagement um so that um students don't fall through the cracks and families don't fall through the cracks well that's that's outstanding thank you i you know i i get to say and you know I, I, I've done a lot of these budget hearings and it's always the school department um budget presentation when i ask a question uh and i get a response that is uh far better than any response i you know would have thought of myself i mean that's terrific that you're, you're doing that much thank help. you so, um you guys are a top knowledge organization the city's lucky to have you guys in um, uh, in leadership over there and keep up the good work keep taking care of our kids thank you very much thank you thank you counselor i'm going to try to go back to counselor kroll if he's um he's with us he's back we're gonna do a take two 
Um, so the question is, um, with students coming in as potential kindergartners for this year, obviously as a parent, that's a pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty heavy conversation that me and my wife are having. And, um, you know, it's a big move for our family. What does that process look like? So that process, as with all of our grades, we're going, we'll be working with all the stakeholders. That includes obviously families um, over the uh, summertime uh, to develop a plan for that. We'll be looking for guidance from the state, as I said earlier, uh, not only the governor's office, but also the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, because they'll set the basis upon which, you know, we will decide what our plan is. I mean, are they going to allow us to return? To school and if so then we'll make a plan based on full re-entry are they going to tell us that we need to continue remote learning uh, right. if that's the case we'll have a plan for that and we'll develop um, a more rigorous uh, plan for that in September as I said through the through the development of the summer program um, so we Right now, we'll be ready for whatever uh, the the directives are from the state, and we will make sure that whatever um, whatever the decision is and whatever plan we're going to move forward with, that our students will be at the center of that decision, and we'll do the best we can under the circumstances to make sure that our students are educated to the best of our ability. Right, totally understand that. It's more a question about new student integration versus, you know, current students coming back. I mean, my understanding was, and I'm not as familiar with the process, so I'm partially being educated here as well, that it was kind of a multiple step checkpoint where a student would, for lack of a better word, be evaluated based on whatever the criteria was. And then, you know, they would, based on parental discretion, move forward to, you know, go to kindergarten or, or I don't know what the alternative would be. I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out a little. Yeah, we'll be working on those plans. Uh, and I know Aaron Perkins, our director of um, uh, one of our uh, curriculum directors and Maddie Roy and all the SLT will be working on those plans with regard to reaching out to parents uh, to get their students evaluated and get them prepared for whatever the state uh, tells us we need to be prepared for. With, again, whether that's uh, continued remote learning or reentry. Um, that plan will be developed with all stakeholders moving forward and certainly parents in the community community will be well aware and um, you know in advance of um, whatever that that decision is and when I say in advance I mean as, as soon as possible in advance yeah I mean it's technically what 90 days away correct right so, so. whatever the plan is as I said the students are going to be and families are going to be our focus and we will make sure that communication is at its highest level particularly during this time we can't communicate enough um, with our parents at this time during a crisis and as the superintendent says communicate 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 particularly during a crisis we do that anyway but we will make sure that everyone knows what the plan is moving forward as soon as possible. Right. It's just a, it's an interesting place to be, right? Because your child or my child has been, you know, at a certain spot for however many years. And now this is a, you know, this is a big change. And it's my wife and I were kind of talking about the other night. It's like you're going to go to a new environment, albeit virtually, right? It, that very well could be the case. Um, where you're starting to kind of learn a new system and learn new people, but it's all, it's all virtual. I mean, I know you covered it a little bit in your comments. Um, I just want to go on the record and saying like, thank you teachers. Cause you know, we have outside of like <laughs> my children been also kind of like doing some home learning and it's um, yeah, everyone just trying to make it work. But as I contemplate sort of the path forward for my son, uh, the environment is just, uh, yeah, it's just, just different, I guess, right? You're absolutely right about thanking the teachers. Um, I mean, without them, none of this would work. I have to say, our relationship with the teachers and the teachers' union, the Quincy Education Association, and President Allison Cox, has never been better. They've been excellent during this process with regard to working with us 
and uh, making sure, again, as I said, that the students are at the center of all of our decision making. And I have to say the teachers and the teachers union have been excellent during this whole process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilor Crow. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Phelan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to comment before I, I ask my questions, uh, Dr. De Cristofaro, thank you for your service. I've worked with you both as a city councilor and as a department head through building of some 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 great schools that have come online in the last couple of years. So I appreciate you, your team, and what you've done for the city. You should be very proud. You've left a very nice legacy to the city. And I'm really looking forward to, to working with you on Quincy College when those issues come up. And just thank you for your service. As a, as a father who had two kids go through the Quincy Public Schools, it was an excellent experience. And I'm very proud of our school system and what they've accomplished in some very difficult times. So thank you for your leadership. Um, a question I had, and I mean, we've all talked about a lot of things with academics and all this. And I, I also realize that sometimes with school, that sometimes there are other issues with that, not just academics. What do you see for the for the future of uh, like the fall sports? And I, I know a couple of, as I, as I walk around to get out of the house, I'm socially distancing and with a mask on. I've had people ask me, what do you think like the Thanksgiving game or, and stuff like that, which, uh, which is also a very big part of high school. And obviously we have to take, take into effect safety for us. But um, do you foresee anything with that or any of those false sports going on? No, absolutely. So obviously athletics, uh, it's a hugely important part of what we do here in the Quincy Public Schools. Athletics, as, as, as everyone knows, is um, a huge draw for students. Um, and it, it just gives them you know, the overall culture with regard to their school. It encourages them to come to school. Uh, encourages them to do well um, because they have the you know the ability to participate uh, in a sport that they love. So athletics is absolutely key uh, to our um, educational programming here in Quincy. And with that, um, we have been moving forward with preparing for fall sports. So just last week, we had interviews uh, regarding uh, girls soccer at Quincy High School and girls soccer at North Quincy High School, for instance. Um, so we're not delaying. Uh, preparations for fall sports. In fact, we are absolutely moving forward. We're continuing with our posts. If we need a new position filled because of a vacancy, we're filling it and we're preparing for fall sports. We're ordering uniforms. We're ordering all the supplies necessary for it. Our hope, again, is that the governor's office and DZ will allow us to return full time and we'll follow whatever restrictions we have to follow with regard to distancing and masks and PPE and hand sanitizer and all that. That's why we're ordering so much now and preparing for the fall. Um, but I believe that um, athletics to students is so important um, that that will not be ignored. And we're moving forward right now with um, the idea of returning full time if possible. And if they, if the state tells us that we have to do something less than that, while still maintaining our um, athletic programming, we're certainly going to do that too. So um, I just, um, it, it's just too important not to move forward with. Okay, I think I lost the last part of it. You broke up. Um, but in, in summary, we're moving forward with our athletic yeah, program for the fall. That's basically, uh, yeah. I, I think it is important because it's obviously part of the high school experience, having had both children play very active in sports and that, that whole it's a combination of academic and also being prepared physically and working as a team. So a lot of people identify. I mean, could we have a Thanksgiving game where everyone's watching it on QTV? I think that could be a possibility, but um, I think it's great that you're moving forward. And, um, and again, a, a great job to the schools, to the teachers, who have continued to do the learning and uh, I'm very impressed with the work that was done. And I've heard from a lot of people who are too. So uh, kudos to you and your team now, Kevin, and congratulations to Dr. on his great legacy and his moving on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Um, 
before I entertain a motion, I'd like to say a couple of words. Uh, first of all, we're in very good hands with Mr. Mulvey and company. Um, had the pleasure of being on the school committee okay. with Mr. Mulvey uh, and worked closely with him for, for a decade or so. Uh, and um, I feel very confident in Kevin and the, and the team that's there. Uh, just going to make sure that that Dr. DeCristofaro doesn't try to take anybody with him. Um, but <laughs> an honor, just an honor and a privilege to work with Rick. Um, he came in a couple of years ahead of me uh, as superintendent. He had, uh, you know, uh, 30 plus in the system. Um, just an honor and a privilege. Uh, prepared all the time. 24-7 access. Uh, Councilor DeBonna mentioned Sundays. It didn't matter if it was Sunday night or Saturday. You get a hold of them. They'll get right back to you. I, we were um, we were spoiled. Um, and we'll be spoiled again, probably, with Mr. Mulvey and company because they care that much about Quincy. I think um, Councilor Palmucci's questions um, always circle back to that answer that we're in a very special community where the school system and all the departments seem to rise to the occasion when we have a dilemma. Uh, and and uh, it all feeds back to the administration, I think, um, in allowing them to come off the leash and, and get things done. So uh, it's been a privilege, Dr. D. I've enjoyed it. We've had a lot of fun, got a lot of work done. And I look forward also uh, to you over at the college and uh, and uh, to help you as much as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. With that, could I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion, motion to, approve. to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hall. you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, team. Councilors, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, next up is um, Chief Keenan and the uh, police budget. Good morning, councilors, and uh, thank you for allowing me to present this unique format. It's We all know it's challenging times, and uh, going forward, hopefully this isn't the new normal, but I look forward to seeing you all in person. Uh, this year's budget, uh, I thank you again for your support and support from the mayor as well. Uh, this year is a fairly lean budget. Uh, as you know, we did hire a number of new offices uh, 22 in total or 21 in total. And those new offices uh, will be going to training starting next week. Uh, there'll be a number of them going to the MBTA Transit Academy. And then uh, we have uh, the rest of them will be going to the Plymouth Academy starting in August. <clears throat> the unfortunate, the timing of the hiring and the unfortunate thing was that uh, these offices, the, all the training had been postponed. Uh, they put a lot of the training that was ongoing on hold and they delayed a couple of the academies. But um, we did do some training up at Quincy High School and the doctor is still on, thank him for that. And thank him for his, all the years of service that he had with the city of Quincy and the great work and relationship that we have uh, as, as partner for the children. It's all for the children. But uh, the budget this year um, is, is fairly flat. There's total increase in the budget, the police budget this year is 100, uh, is 1.68%, uh, which is about $519,000 in total. Some of the new funding for the new offices that we're going to hire uh, is going to come out of COVID-19 funding. The city received some money for funding for COVID-19. So I believe we're able to use some of that funding to uh, increase the ranks of the Quincy Police Department. Um, the, most of the line items are either contractual, small contractual raises or some raises in training time went up a little bit. Uh, and that's to, because we have to train all of our offices in 40 hours each year, mandatory training and also some of the in-service training that we have to do to keep some of our specialists uh, up to snuff and trained. So I'd be glad to take any questions if you have any. A chair recognizes Councilor Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chief. How are you? Good morning, Councilor. How are you? I'm good. I am. Um... I always say this with your department because I never have any issues with needing to cut anything, but then I look at um, what was spent and I feel like you've always come in so you know conservative and tight in your numbers. Um, and I always worry that you, you don't ask for enough because we want to give you everything that you need, but 
specifically too, and just going through these items for the uniform allowance, um, you went down significantly and that is, and we're bringing on some new hires. So could you just clarify why that need isn't there? That's because contractually the uh, unions agreed to forego their uniform allowance. Uh, in the last few, the last uh, contractual agreement with the superiors and the patrol officers, that uh, differential was eliminated. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. That was it. I was just curious. Is um, you know, again, we can't add to the budget. Um, if I could, I would probably push back on you a little bit in your department. I really always do appreciate um how careful and conservative you are with these numbers when you come in. And as always, you know, we're here for whatever you and your team need. So thank you, thank Chief. You. Really appreciate it. As far as uh, this year's budget, I think we're gonna probably come in under budget. Uh, the mayor's asked that if we can make any uh, any cuts, legitimate cuts that we need um, or that we don't need in funding, we can return some money to the city during these difficult times. And I've made some adjustments to try and do that without any interruption of service. I'm thinking that I make them in under budget in those, you know, within the next few weeks or the next month or so, we have some kind of a problem. But I think we're looking pretty good in this year's budget as well. I appreciate that. I think um, throughout anything that may come and, and um, that we have to address your face as a city, you know, again, no one in your department stops, you know, so again, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate your work on that. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Palmucci and then Councilor Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Chief. Uh, good, uh, good morning, Chief. Nice to see you. Um, just wanted to um, check in. How is... Um, how has your department uh, been faring in terms of um, contraction of COVID-19 among officers? We uh, presently have zero cases. We've had three cases over the course of the last several months. I'm pleased to say that all three officers uh, fully recovered and they're back to work. <clears throat> I think some of the steps that we took very early on, uh, we made a number of steps, took a number of steps very early when this was just starting to hit the forefront. We eliminated roll calls and gatherings of offices. We basically, the offices now report right to the back deck of the station, check in with the sergeant, get in their cruises, and off they go. Uh, also, I'd like to give kudos to the um, uh, custodial staff. They've been tremendous with decontaminating the building, disinfecting continuously throughout the day. I think some of those moves uh, were helpful. We shut down our lobby, basically, uh, to uh, the public, and we did a lot of things either by phone, offline, or meet people you know, wherever in a safer place. I think that was that was uh, helpful. Uh, so some of the steps that we did take, and we're continuously monitoring it. Uh, we're one of the lower in the state as far as uh, offices that were infected. Um, every day there's an update, a, a sheet from uh, the Mass Major City Chiefs, and it gives active cases, isolation, that type of thing. And we've been consistently one of the bottom as far as uh, having our offices contracted the, great, uh, the, the uh, disease. Uh, we've is issued masks to all of our offices. We've gone out and purchased cloth masks so they can continue with on details or if they're you know in the cruise when they have to engage somebody we also have uh, PPE we've been uh, searching high and low for protective equipment some of our uh, community partners have been tremendous about getting us whatever equipment that they have that they can spare Home Depot and a few of the stores a few of the private citizens have been great about getting us PPE uh, Ali Sleeman down at the emergency management is in contact with the state uh, as far as MEMA and FEMA trying to get uh, the equipment, we're in pretty good shape, we think, at this point. But we want to make sure we continue to be in good shape and go forward. So um, we're, we're faring pretty well, all in all. The long answer well, that's good know. news. Yeah, that's good news. Only three cases. How yeah. many um, How many officers have been put into quarantine? Um, I think six in uh, six in total. When what What's happened is when they, we have an exposure, we've been sending them for testing down at the minute. Uh, Manic Clinic down on uh, West yep. Guantanamo Street, which is, they've been tremendous community partners as well. Everyone that we've asked to be tested has gone right down within a day and gotten tested. Normally, if they're exposed or if they have symptoms, we put them out on isolation for a brief period of time. Once they're tested, I confer with Ruby Jones, who has also been fantastic through this whole thing. Uh, she's a real champion. And Ruthie, I usually use Ruthie's guidance as far as if they need to stay out longer or shorter. Most of the times what's happening is after after the uh, test comes back, which is usually, you know, within a couple of days now, uh, if it comes back negative and the offices come back to work, that's, you know, by, by uh, virtue of the CDC guidelines for essential people. And uh, so it seems like it's been working quite efficiently. So it, it really sounds like your operational capacity has not missed a beat at all with only six officers being quarantined and three being out. I mean, that's, 
it seems relatively easy to handle that manpower of loss, right? It is. We actually have a contingency plan for 12 hour shifts with days off, you know, with a certain amount of days off, certain amount of days on, essentially splitting the department in half uh, to make sure that we have a, at least a half safe workplace or half safe work crew. And then we'll flip flop uh -huh. them. We haven't had to do that. Um, so it's, it's kind of worked well uh, throughout. And we're just hopeful that it continues. We just can't let our guard down because I'm trying to get quick right. end of it. That's good. And what about um, custodies and arrests? <clears throat> custodies and arrests are down. The officers do still make arrests for any kind of a serious crime. Uh, what they do is they'll take them into the station. We book them here. And then the Norfolk County uh, House of Correction has agreed to take the prisoners if, like, for long term, if it was going to be a weekend, long weekend or a weekend. <clears throat> they have been very, very good about taking in our prisoners. So we don't keep them in the station very long and then they i believe they vet them out when they get out to the jail it's actually also worked uh because of the arraignments like on a monday morning they have a better system we can do a phone in type of arraignment system but they have a better system they actually have a video conferencing system so it's much more efficient it's better for all all concerned the attorneys the judge and the the suspect so that's kind of worked very well uh we're trying not to for minor crimes we're taking out subpoenas and sentences people right. aren't getting away with bad behavior but right. what they'd still be held accountable but it just may be at a later date right so just for an example that'd be something like somebody stealing um something from walmart and police would normally show up and they could arrest them take them back to the station book them have them held until an arraignment in, in court whereas now you can summons them so you give them uh, you take their information at the scene uh, you let them know they're going to be summons and then they get uh they're not taken into custody and then they get a notice from the court when to appear for their arraignment right that's correct yeah they usually get it how it generally works they'll get a trespass notice from whatever store we'll use walmart as an example then they we would subpoena them in so they would be held accountable at a later date all right and then obviously the, the thinking which makes sense the thinking on that is the less people you have in the police cars in the police station um the better for the officers and the better better for the people um, who are being arrested, that they're not exposed to any potential contaminants, right? That's correct. We've also implemented a policy that uh, when there is an arrest, a physical custody has to take place. We transport those people home in the police wagon. We have a new police wagon. We, we were awarded that, I think it was a year or so ago. It's about a year old. So normally that would be used for back and forth from the, um, the courthouse. And if there was an unruly uh, prisoner or whatever, if uh, most of the times the officers would transport in the, their own vehicles, we put an end to that. So now the only the only uh, transport vehicle we use is the um, the wagon, the police wagon. And the thought behind that was we can decontaminate that decontaminate that pretty quickly uh, after each prisoner comes into the station, and then we can de de decontaminate the cell block area when we release the prisoner. So it kind of keeps the offices out of that mix. Well, that's great. That's that's great. That's all good news. I'm glad to hear that um, we haven't had. Uh, too many cases of COVID affect uh, our police officers. So it's a good sign. Fingers crossed. Keep up the good work, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor. Chair recognizes Councilor Mahoney. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Councilor McCarthy. Um, good morning, Chief. I just had a couple of questions. Nina asked the uniform allowance question. I also had the educational differential. That looks like it also went down fairly substantially. I was curious to know why. Uh, the educational, it's, a, it's no longer the Quinn bill. The Quinn bill had a set fixed amount uh, that offices were awarded. It was 10% uh, for a um, um, uh, associate's degree, 20% 20 for a bachelor's degree, and 25% for a master's degree. Uh, in the last uh, several uh, several contracts ago, I believe two contracts ago, maybe eight years ago, uh, that was renegotiated, and now it became the Quincy Educational Incentive, which all new offices, uh, instead of getting the full amount from the Quinn, um, they get 10% uh, for a uh, back, uh, associate's, 12% for a uh, master's, and 5%, I'm sorry, 5% for a uh, an associate's, 10% for a uh, ma uh, bachelor's, and then 15% for a master's degree. So the percentages have gone down, and also new offices that are hired uh, and are not eligible for that benefit for the first year. So that's why uh, that went down, because we have offices that are retiring who are getting the full Quinn amounts of, for example, 25% for a uh, master's degree. They're being, new offices are being hired into those positions uh, at uh, at half that rate. So that's that's why that went down. Okay. Um, thank you for explaining that. 
Then I just had a couple of questions. Um, I, I appreciate you're saying that you're going to be coming in. You might be coming in. You didn't actually guarantee you're coming in lower um, this year. What areas do you think that you're going to be coming in lower and then why? Uh, well, I think some of the overtime, we move money around at the end of the year. Okay. And uh, and I, we will, I don't know that we'll do that. This year, we may just turn the budget back in. So there may be some overages in certain areas yeah. uh, that we did not spend, including some of the overtime. Because uh, thankfully, with the last several months with um with the COVID situation, uh, offices aren't taking as much time off. We haven't utilized an awful lot of overtime as far as having to backfill shifts and that type of thing. Uh -huh. So I may be able to return whatever that money is and any money that's not spent in any of the contractual lines, uh, that money will be returned as well as best I can do. Yeah, and, that's the, and, and that actually answers my question because I noticed that in your um, in your overtime lines that you're kind of at, you're much lower than, um, than you normally are. So I just was curious about that. Um, that's pretty much, I, I, I noticed that there was, there's, there's numbers that went up. I'm assuming that some of the things that went up were due to new hires, like the holiday, holiday, police fire, that type of things. Um, yeah. for, uh, and, and if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but uh, for most of the lines that did go up, I'm, those are mostly for the new hires, correct? Reading yeah. time, new offers is for reading time as well, contractual. Correct. Any yeah. of those contractual line items that did go up were the result, there was no increase, but just the result of the new, um, the new hires. And I also noticed in Patrolman um, um, 3, it looks like it went down, but it looks like it was offset with the um, Patrolman 2 and 1. Is that correct? That's correct. Because, uh, as I said, we're losing offices towards retirement yeah. uh, or a number of, you know, a number of retirees. So as a result, uh, with those folks are, um, are funded at less of a rate. So the, the numbers change in the categories. One of the things that's difficult, and this is not just to you, Chief, this is throughout the whole budget, because the, there's, I see the shifts that are happening, but we don't, what I can't tell is how many, um, what your, what your full um, force looks like and, and how many people um, pick up what, different divisions of each one. So maybe that's something you could share with us um, at a later date, just because it's, it's hard to be able to tell. Um, but I think it's important for us to know that as well. How many people just in total without, um, never mind the rankings, how many people make up? Police force total. Um, there is a chief. There's five captains. There's 14 lieutenants. There's 30 sergeants. And at present, uh, we will be up to 172, 178 patrolmen. Although before those folks even get going in the academy, there's a number of retirements. So I'm anticipating with the retirements, we will be down to about 170 patrolmen, which is up about six positions from last year when yep. everything shifts out. I don't know the exact dates. We have um, a couple of people that are in the disability pipeline mm -hmm. that as soon as they step PEREC and the Quincy Retirement Board starts meeting, we anticipate that those folks will be put in, into a disability retirement. We've got a number of retirements, like for example, uh, Lieutenant Mitten will be retiring at the end of the month in June, the end, the end of June after uh, about 37 years uh, service with the city, tremendous service, and he's been an excellent officer, Roger White. So the, the, we'll be retiring, I believe, in sometime in June. You probably all know Roger. He was our community police officer for a number of years. So yeah. we anticipate there's several uh, retirements in the pipeline, but when everything shifts down and all those retirements happen, mm -hmm. I think we're going to be right around 170, maybe maybe a little bit under. The, goal, was get to one, the goal originally was to get to 170. I hope that we can maintain that. You know, there's always antici uh, unanticipated offices that, that uh, die up. So. Yeah. I thank you. That, I mean, I, I figured you would know it off the top of your head. I do appreciate that. And um, I, I I just was curious, and I, I appreciate the updates for the retirements, too. And, and um, that's to Lieutenant Minton and to um, Lieutenant R White. Thank you. Thank you very much, Counselor. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Chair recognizes Counselor Phelan and Counselor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the chief. Um, a qu question I have for you. So you're up around 170 now on patrolmen, on patrolmen at this point. Yeah, that, well, that's what we anticipate once it's okay. done, once it vets out. So, um, which is, is, in my opinion, is a great number because I can remember when you were a lot lower than that at times. And so with, with all these men, you, you feel you can cover all the all the all the cars and everything that needs to go out every day and all that. I can. I feel fairly comfortable uh, with that. I mean, we we increased the size of the department when I took over <clears throat> 12 years ago. Uh, they hadn't been an awful lot of hiring. We were down to 146. So uh, 
down from a previous high when I took over, when I actually started, I think we're about, I was badge number 169, uh, 164, and I think we had 169 offices, and that was 37 years ago. The city has grown by leaps and bounds, but I think we are able to provide tremendous service in to the city, to uh, the residents. It's a great, safe city, and I, I feel comfortable with that number at this point. Okay. All right, Chief. Um, I was going to ask you about the breakdown, but you already gave that. So I'll just move on and say you're doing a great job, and particularly fact that these people go out every day into the job and they're, they're facing more than just uh, criminals and public service now, they're facing violence, which they have to deal with every day. And uh, and I know as a city resident, I feel very safe knowing that I can pick up the phone and call the police department. So thank you very much, Chief. Uh, thank you. Any, any support will always be there for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Chair recognizes Councillor DeMona. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief Keenan, thanks. Thanks for coming on this morning and um, presenting your budget. I just want to tell you that you guys, you men and women are doing a fantastic job, um, utmost respect and professionalism with our citizens of Quincy and, and anywhere, any person. Um, it's just, um, you run a great, um, great system over there. And I want to thank you guys and women for all that work. Um, just two things. Um, how are we doing on the uh, drug overdoses and how, how is that looking on the horizon with the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, two categories, crime in general and the call volume has been significantly reduced over the last, say, two months or whatever, <clears throat> March and April. Um, it's start, we're starting to see a spike now. But one thing that has been fairly consistent is the drug overdoses. They've been up a little bit. Uh, we have seen a good size spike in domestic violence reported uh, issues and incidents. So those are the two categories that have actually kind of gone up a little bit, not something that we really, it's its outrageously uh, in, increased, but it has increased uh, a little bit since the beginning of the lockdown and the, and the COVID situation. With the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, does it, in the PPE and all the different measures of protecting yourselves, um, your police officers, has any changes been made based on the um, naloxin um, not canning situation and how you're going to be able to do that for the future? Um, is there any changes to that based on this disease that's out there? Uh, the only changes is now when the offices engage uh, any anyone that needs not can that they to use PPE, so they glove up, up gown up, and uh, mask up while they're doing the administration of the. Uh, of the nasal knock in okay so that's um, really that, can change yep. yeah <clears throat> um it's dangerous before the pandemic i think it's a dangerous situation for our police fire emts anyone that has to administer that because um the car fentanyl the fentanyl is it, just dangerous stuff out there every day um the last question i have is the shannon grant um we i originally was on the park and recreation board many years ago are you still receiving that Shannon Grant? And if so, are you still patrolling over in the West Quincy, South Quincy, um, Sterling Middle School area? Yes, we still do get this Shannon Grant and uh, and we have been patrolling all of the areas. And actually we're looking maybe to use the uh, Shannon Grant to help us. We've been doing um, some park patrols as well with the uh, Recreation Department. We've been doing the park patrols just about every weekend as best we can. Um, we've had some areas of concern that down the neck, I know the crusher has been an area of concern yep. with uh, complaints about the kids drinking or not down there. So we do still have the Shannon grant. We will use that uh, throughout the city, including the West Quincy corridor. I, uh, unfortunately, I'd rather see the beer cans than the drugs, <laughs> drug overdoses, unfortunately. But, um, I know council McCarthy has been on and, uh, been on the forefront with the crusher situation, but, um, I just want to thank you for all your hard work, Chief, and um, I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, uh, With that, if I can make a motion to approve, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, motion on the floor by Councilor DeBona. Any conversation on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks, Chief. Thank you very much, you. I appreciate uh, all your support, especially during the last couple of months, which has been very challenging for everybody in the city. But I know a number of you have personally reached out to see if we needed anything. And I, I know it goes a long way. Thank you again for your support. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Chief. you.
And uh, before you leave us, we have uh, one more. We got the animal control that you can touch on, Chief. Sure. I, that's basically providing the same level of service that we provided last year with level funding. Motion approved. Motion by Councilor Kane. Any conversation on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. All right. Next up is uh, Chief Jackson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Councilors. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate your time very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, uh, as you can see, uh, I want to thank you again for your time for presenting the 2021 budget. And as you can see, uh, it's a pretty lean budget. We're looking for a total increase uh, over the course of the fiscal year of $42,000. So uh, exceptionally lean, especially given the fact that we've just put on 34 new recruits. Uh, and to that point, I want to thank you all. I want to thank Mayor Koch and his office and you, the counselors, uh, for all of your support. With the drill school that just concluded a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, as I said, we just put 34 new recruits onto the department. And uh, last Friday, we had a couple of fires in the city overnight, one down Howes Neck, one in North Quincy. And the officers that I spoke to uh, were all, uh, they spoke very highly about the recruits and they were all very grateful for the increased manpower. There's a big difference uh, showing up with an officer and two firefighters and an officer and three firefighters. That extra guy makes all the difference in the world, especially when seconds count. And they did last Friday. These guys did a tremendous job. So uh, thank you very much for all of your support. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability on the uh, this year's budget. Or, uh, Chair recognizes uh, Councilor Phelan, then Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the, the to, to Chief Jackson. Um, how many how many actual firefighters do we have on right now? Uh, with the new recruits being put on, we're at 177. So, so, so that means you can maintain all the pieces of equipment. Correct. Correct. So we've. We, we are fully manned. Now, on the pieces of equipment, is it still one and two, or are we we've up to one and three now? Yeah, most, a lot of the pieces now are riding one and three. Uh, we expect we have eight mandatory retirements over the next year, so that number will go down to about 169 or so. But right now, yeah, the majority of the pieces are riding one and three, which is a huge, huge benefit to us. Because I, I think uh, over the years, talking with different fire chiefs and stuff like that, my first time on the council, Chief Barry was the chief at the time. And one of the things he always said was, you need to have the manpower once you exactly get to the right. fire to really make a difference. Yeah, there's um, just so much to do. There's, it's just having the manpower. One extra guy makes a huge difference on each piece. It wouldn't seem that it would, but it does. One other, one other question I had is under contractual, the mm -hmm. EMT course and, and fire, uh, isn't is that still part of their contract where they if they were an EMT they got a certain amount of pay? I'm just wondering why that was zero. Uh, you know what that was that was eliminated as of last year. I'm not sure why it's on this. I actually spoke to our business manager just this morning and I had that same question myself and he was saying that that was actually eliminated uh, as of last year. Okay, so that was uh, are they st is this still a differential in their pay for being there an is. EMT? Yeah, there so is. that's. In another line, oh, I, I see it up here. Okay, which I think is very important. I remember when that came into the contract, and I think it's very important to maintain and keep all the firefighters at an EMT level, where medicals is a big part of it. Agreed, agreed. All right, Chief. Uh, again, I just say a great job. Um, all the people who have been working, I, I think now we, we don't look at the ball player, we don't look at other people as the heroes, as the first responders <laughs> and the medical people. And thank you for your service and thank all your firemen for doing this in a very difficult time. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Chair recognizes Councillor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Acting Chief Jackson, we're back at it again, right? Um, good morning. Good morning. Chief, Chief Cadigan was in there for a little while. You're back in there. I, like I told you before, I think you do a fantastic job. Um, I thank you for all that. Um, just a little bit about North Quincy and Howes Neck, the, both the fires. They were almost simultaneously at the same time. Yeah. And to have the, the proper manpower to be able to mitigate them at the same exact time is very important. 
which obviously you know you're in the field, you're a specialist, the, the response time, having that extra person on call. So um, I'm always happy to support your, your budget, always happy to support capital improvement plans, especially with the new gear, the second gear that you have, washing machines, showers, um, renovations that were done outside and inside um, some of the stations. Um, it's, it's really important. Um, the 34 new recruits uh, drill school. I, I see a lot of the uh, photos and, and, and videos that you do um, at the drill, I think over at St. Mary's that you were doing them. Yes. You also were doing something on top of one of the buildings. Um, I want to say the O'Connell building, you were doing some, some midi, uh, some type of training up there, but um, I tell you, that's pretty fearless up there. But, um, <laughs> It sure is. I saw some video. I said, wow, that's, that's high. It's, it's, uh, but uh, just in general, just kudos to the whole crew out there. And I thank you for all your time and energy and um, to, to mitigate these fires. And um, I think now you talked about you're at 177. You just had Chief Keenan on here. We're talking at 170. He thinks it's going to be with the retires. So uh, with the 34 new recruits, it is going to be very, very helpful looking forward to um, at a hundred thousand population here in Quincy. So, um, no questions at all. Just, just kudos to you guys. And, um, you know, hopefully stay safe with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, counselor. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counselor. Um, any other questions for the chief counselor Palmucci? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, chief. Good morning, counselor. Uh, I, I don't know if you were on, um, when we went through the police budget, but I just have the same series of questions for you about um, uh, how the <clears throat> how the troops have been doing during the outbreak. Have you had any infections? Uh, we've all been any? doing pretty well, thank you. I was on. I was I was watching uh, Chief Keenan. Yeah, kind of a similar situation. We we've had just uh, one member come down positive. Uh, he recovered fine. Fortunately, we've had other members that we've uh, self isolated because there were potential exposures. And again, uh, to piggyback on what Chief Keenan said earlier, uh, huge um, props to Man at Health, because anytime there is a potential exposure, I get in touch with Man at Health. They get us in right away and we get test results back within a couple of days, which is great to get the guys back into the rotation as quickly as possible. Uh, and fortunately, everybody has come back negative. So um, That's terrific. And we've been very you- diligent and luck's been on our side. So. Do you have a, um, a staffing plan similar to what the chief was talking about of going to 12 hour days? Do you have any such um, ability to do that? I know the fire service is far different in how you schedule shifts. Yeah, actually, um, for the last couple of months, maybe the last seven weeks, we have everything set up in such a way that all of the firehouses are completely isolated. They're basically like their own little microcosm. Any overtime that needs to be hired is only hired with personnel from that particular station to avoid mixing and we've been doing 48 consecutive hours and then six days off which has worked out really really well that uh, cuts in half the amount of personnel changeovers throughout the week and it minimizes exposures in that regard we also have our lieutenant uh, Darcy our hazmat lieutenant he's been coming around twice a week and he's been decontaminating uh, all of the stations all of the apparatus all of the equipment and I know that that has gone a long way in keeping us safe as well so like I say we've been We've been very diligent. The guys have been very patient, and uh, we've been we've been fortunate. So everything's been pretty good, all things considered. As if you guys didn't have enough health risks already in doing your <laughs> job, you know. Yeah. Well, these guys have done a great job. You know, I get it done, but I get a lot of support from the guys. They show up, they do their job, and it's that's that makes all the difference. It makes my job a lot easier. So. And in terms of um, uh, PPE, how are you situated with masks? I mean, what? PPE, as of the last week, couple of weeks, we're in a much better position. Um, again, huge thanks to uh, to Ruth Jones, to Ali Sleeman. Ali Sleeman has probably got us over 1,500 KN95 masks right now. Each member of the department has at least five KN95 masks, and these aren't one-type use masks. They can use it until it starts to physically break down. And uh, in addition to each member having five, we have 1,200 KN95s in reserve and 1,000 surgical masks. So we're, we're pretty good, all things considered, again, uh, right now. Uh, hopefully this is something that's in the rearview mirror within the next few months, or, and uh, we can move on from it. But uh, right now, all things considered, it's pretty good. And in, and in terms of operation, uh, Chief Keenan discussed how um, 
they're purposely not arresting minor crimes, but giving them summons. Uh, I believe I was told by someone um, <clears throat> that we were changing the way in which we handled medical calls. Is that correct? Um, Brewster is kind of being the tip of the spear on the medical calls. We'll still go and support them, which was usually the case. But uh, Brewster's kind of, they're, they're the ones that kind of go in and take the history. If we have to, there's been plenty of situations where we've been exposed. We arrived prior to Brewster and we've had people do CPR on people that uh, uh, were running a fever. We didn't know if they were COVID related. We had to wait to get word back. So there's been plenty of sticky situations on our end, but we're kind of, with the, uh, the issue in getting PPE, we're kind of standing back where Brewster is much better fortified with the PPE than we are. They're kind of going and doing the case history and then we'll assist if necessary. Uh, so we're kind of playing it like that. And Brewster has been, Chris Devon has just been exceptional to deal with. They've been really, really great with this whole thing. So. Right. Okay. Well, good. Sounds like you you have, a, um, you know, some some appropriate plans in place and you're, you're well equipped. We want to make sure we keep... Uh, we keep everybody safe out there. So if you need anything, you know, give us a holler, let us know. But thank well, you and keep up the good work. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Councilor. Anyone else with questions for Chief Jackson? Can I entertain a motion from well, someone? Motion to approve. approve. Motion to approve. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Chief Jackson. Thank you very thank much, Chief. Chief. Thank Thanks, you, Councilors. All right. We're almost there. Um, the best for last. Uh, Al Grazioso is up and uh, he'll start off with uh, engineering. Good morning. I don't know why my camera is not coming up. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Hold on one second. No, we're good without seeing you, Al. We're all okay. <laughs> uh, try, try the on button, Commissioner. Yeah, it, it's... Showing it's on. Right here? There we go. So, <laughs> it's coming up no camera. I don't know. It's showing me as a co-host. I don't know why. El Grass. Dave, you might have to turn me on. Well, Al, your video is on, but for some reason, something's happening on your end. So if you go, see the bottom, do you see the bottom right-hand corner or the bottom left-hand corner of your screen where you see the little video camera? Yeah, I just clicked it on, but it's not coming on. Either. Yeah, so do you see the arrow right next to it, though, the arrow pointing upwards? Yeah. So click on that and go to your video settings. Do you see that? Yeah. So in the video settings, you should be able to pick the camera that you want to use. You just want to make sure that your camera settings are turned on to allow you to use it in Zoom. Yeah, it's um. Oh, it's on, right? Do you plan to do a dance? Yeah, do you plan to do a dance while presenting? I think we can still hear. <laughs> okay, why don't I? Yeah, why don't I just um? Go ahead. I can just start and we'll, we'll talk. Um, so good morning. Um, before you today, a DPW budgets and include engineering, public works, snow and ice, trash, drain, and water and sewer enterprise funds. Our total operating budgets combined for this uh, these departments is $62,914,000. It's a decrease from last year. As you'll see, we have made cuts to each one of these budgets with the exception of trash which increased due to contractual increases and uh, basically the collapse of the recycling market. With me today, I've got Superintendent Larry Prendeville, City Engineer Paul Costello, our Business Manager Paul Della Barbara, and our Operations Manager Mike Norton. 
Uh, they're here to help with any questions I may not be able to answer. Uh, so I just want to take the opportunity now to recognize and thank the hardworking men and women of DPW for the work they do on a daily basis, uh, serving our residents in a professional and efficient manner, uh, especially during this COVID crisis. So the first budget tonight is our engineering budget. Currently, the engineering department is managing 48 million in capital projects. Uh, this includes the Adam Shore seawall project, water main replacement, sewer main replacement lining, road and sidewalk reconstruction, pump station replacements, and drainage design. We'll be working on a total of 114 roadways this season, not including national grid uh, work, which we also monitor. So I just wanted to acknowledge city engineer Paul uh, Costello and his department for the incredible work they're doing. This year alone, our engineers saved nearly 400,000 in design costs by designing all, all of our water mains and, and road reconstruction in-house. We had previously design, designed all of our water mains using private outside contractors. Uh, we'll also manage- Our office. Hi, Brian, how are you? I'm well, George, and yourself? He's muted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go ahead. We're, all, we're also managing these projects completely in-house, which is saving a considerable amount of money. So the engineering budget decreased by $10,812 uh, this year coming up. Uh, that decrease was due to, we cut a position, a junior civil engineer. We added a half a position uh, which we allocated 50-50 with the Water Enterprise Fund. Um, also in this budget, you're gonna see that um, we, we have the project manager resident liaison position. Um, that was funded in fiscal 20 through uh, water and sewer contractual services and road CIP. Uh, this position is uh, Mr. Kintakos, and it's really become an essential position for this department. Um, what he does uh, in residential services, what he does for the engineering department, uh, you know, tracking his spreadsheets, um, going out and answering constituent calls on these projects, uh, meeting with constituents. He, he handled nearly a thousand calls last year. Uh, what he's done working with the pot department on, on uh, the tree issue on these roads, um, tracking everything on spreadsheets, uh, he saved us a considerable amount of money in our MS4 budget because he went out and tracked all of uh, the outfalls that we were paying an outside engineer for. Uh, and he's basically given the engineering department uh, the engineers relief from a lot of those duties. Now they can concentrate on what they do best, managing these uh, road projects and, and these contractors. So that's a position that, um, again, is just uh, – it's Come invaluable to us. Um, you'll also see that there's a, an increase in the GIS position, um, a slight increase. Um, some of you may not know, but Fred Kapanos, um, our GIS administrator, left in February. Um, we have been looking for a GIS administrator. We actually have gotten uh, people from all across the country apply for the job uh, due to market. Um, you know, what we see in the market we felt that to attract someone of fred's quality we had to increase that salary line item that's uh, that salary uh, by 1869 and that's across i believe five budgets um so in that budget you'll see other cuts um and some small increases there was a slight increase in the administrative secretary doing an upgrade uh, but overall, that budget was cut by $10,812. And uh, any questions you may have? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilor Kane. Uh, on the motion, Councilor Liang. Thank you. Al, for the, um, for the GIS administrator, when you said it spread across five different um, departments, can you just give me the total for what it was, what the salary was when Fred left and what it went up to? I think it went from 72 to 82. To 82, though. okay. And then which departments is it spread over again? It's spread over, um, it's engineering, water, sewer, drain, um, and public highway, public works. Okay. All right, thanks, Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Councilor. Um, anyone else for questions on the motion? Seeing no further questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. Thanks, Al. We'll go on to Public Works. Okay, the Public Works budget decreased by 151,544. Um, we cut one laborer, MEO Mason, and added one Mason heavy MEO, which had a net increase to the budget of 1,690. Uh, we also reallocated one ME repair two position uh, to water and sewer. We cut two, way, two highway maintenance work. Um, additionally, transportation supplies, that is, um, that's gasoline. We decreased that by $50,000 due to uh, favorable, favorable pricing uh, that allowed the city to lock in prices through August 2022. Um, so I'd be happy to go through each line with you, uh, our decreases, and how we got to that number. If you have any questions, Chair recognizes Councilor Yang. Thank you, line item. It's the pothole repair items. So to date, you've not spent anything in it, but looking at the historic numbers um, from previous fiscal years, you always spend the full 30000 So I'm just trying to figure out um, if it hasn't been spent yet or if this is something that just gets built from purchasing or, or if you can explain that to me. Um, there still could be some, um, some invoices, but this year, as we know, it's a very light year of potholes. Um, look at a budget like this, um, you know, this year, because of the winter, we had a very mild uh, pothole repair season. Now, because of that, we started sweeping earlier, doing street sweeping, which, you know, the cost of that budget will probably go up. So you'll see sometimes we do transfers in these budgets because it's it just no year is the same. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we did luck out because of the pothole, but again, our street sweeping uh, probably went up because we we got to it early and we increased it. Gotcha. Okay. Thank um, you. That was all. Thank you. All. Thanks, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments, questions? Chair recognizes Councillor Mahoney. Hey, Al. I just um, I, I wanted to thank you. I did notice that there was some transfers that were going on, but I, I worked with um, the auditor today just to kind of go over some of these things. And what I do appreciate about your budget, and I appreciate also Council Yang's question in regards to the um, GIS person, is that you've come in very, very conservatively and you've tightened everything up as best as you can. So, um, I and the amount of work that you guys get done is um, is rather, it's just it's in the in the amount of um, projects that you're managing. It's it's just kind of amazing how much that gets done for all the departments that you manage. So I just wanted to thank you for. Um, the effort you put into your budget and recognizing um, the situation we're, we're headed into with um, with the economy the way it is, but being able to maintain our city as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Appreciate that. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, entertain a motion to approve. Motion, motion to approve. approve. Motion to approve. Uh, on the motion, no other conversation. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And the ayes have it. Thanks, Al. We'll go to Snow and ice. Snow and ice, uh, no changes to snow and ice. It's the same funding as last year. And hopefully uh, we'll have the same type of year next year. Um, as you know, we had, a, I believe, a million dollars uh, we ended up giving back. Um, so, and I, pre I believe the year before we also uh, gave back. So, let's just keep, keep this going. <laughs> okay. Okay. Motion approved by President Liang. On the motion. All those in, oh, on the motion, Councilor Phelan. Yeah, just quick, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just quickly to uh, the DPW Commissioner. The amount we're up to, is is this the amount that an average snow year might have now? Or uh, I, I know every year we would incrementally increase it, but uh, is this number a more realistic number than what we used to put in? The 300. Yeah, I, I think we used to put in uh, 300 uh, council. And um, I know every year the mayor has increased this. And I think the last two years we've leveled it. Um, so, you know, again, we just don't know if we have a 2015 situation again, then all bets are off. 
Yeah, but I, I think I'm more comfortable seeing it at the higher level. I remember the years when they used to only throw 300,000 in and we had some huge snow years and it would look, it just, we were always scrambling to make up for that. So I, I think that's a great thing to have it in and have it at that level. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. We had a motion uh, by President Liang. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks, Al. We'll go to uh, collection and disposal. Okay, a fun one. Okay, collection disposal. Um, we had a contractual increases to the budget line, uh, solid waste disposal and collection of solid waste. Uh, that goes with contractual increases uh, with capital. Um, so there's nothing we can do about that. The, um, let's grab my budget here. Um, the other increase you will see is the recyclable material. Um, and I'm gonna let Paul Della Baba talk to you about that. And he can kind of go through the blended value and what's actually happening in the recycle market. Morning, councils. How are you? Morning, Paul. Okay, so the um, the recycling it, it, it's kind of hard to estimate now and, and predict of where we're going to be at because of um, the commodity market for the recyclables. Um, so I just to step back. I, I'd like to point out that in May of 2018, the blended value was at $19.20. Um, and what that tells, tells us is, you know, our contractual rate for a processing fee at that time was $88. We were getting $19 back uh, for our recyclables, which brought out, reduced our rate down to $68.80. It, it was a good deal. Now it's gone completely the opposite way. Um, Right now, the blended value is uh, minus seven dollars and ninety-five cents, and our processing fee is, you know, gone up contractually to one hundred. So we're now paying a hundred and nine dollars per ton to um, process our recyclable material. So I reached out to waste management to ask them where they saw this going prior to COVID nineteen, and they told me to basically plan on a surcharge up to anywhere is um, to around $25 per ton. So that, that could bring our processing fee up to $126 per ton. Um, there's, there's really not a strong market for recycled material materials uh, at this point. Any questions from Mr. Delavala? Uh, President Liang? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question on that. So, um, do they give you any sense as to what the surcharge is coming from? Is it from? Uh, well, uh, is it like during just this pandemic, where you know, particularly over the last two months, well, where obviously yeah. everywhere, you know, like specifically businesses um, yeah. aren't potentially paying or anything like that? Oh, uh, so basically, nobody. There's no demand for this recycled material at this time, and it's been declining since uh, 2018. Um, okay. Back in 2018, you know, there's still a, a demand overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, China in particular was, was a big purchaser of um, the cardboard and the glass and all this plastic material that we were recycling. But since then, they've entered the market themselves. So demand has dried up. So what happens is we're basically paying people now to store this recyclable material. And until the market turns around, it, and right now with the economy at, you know, in a standstill, um, it, it doesn't look like there's gonna be much of a demand anytime soon. Yeah, okay, I just didn't know if it was, um, you know, something about that the companies are trying to off balance and offset with municipalities rates going up if um, private businesses with larger buildings or developments potentially were closed and maybe weren't paying. So um, I was just curious about that. And uh, the second and last question I have for you is actually for two items that uh, both of them had gone down. One is the 30 yard containers and the other is recycling bins. Um, is that for, I, I know that we were working on trying to do municipal um, 
what is it, recycling bins and, and containers and whatnot. Is this this line item? And if it's not, then why did these two line items go down? Well, the recycling bins um, went down. Um, we, we didn't purchase any this year. We're going to have some purchases coming up for the schools and the public buildings this year. I, I actually, when it got late in the year, I told Mr. Sullivan uh, not to spend any money. Out of it. As we tighten the belts, the mayor asked us to tighten the belt. So I, I asked him not to spend money there. Uh, we will need that money this year because we do need, we will need recycle bins coming up for the schools and public buildings. Okay. All right. And, and you know, even though, I mean, it's cut, you, you cut these lines significantly. That's going to be enough to cover um, what you think you'll need for, for the buildings? Yes. Okay. Um, so then to that end, uh, because I, it, it now has me thinking about the citywide barrels that we were doing. Is that something that you can update us on? Or Mr. Walker, if you could just give us a really, really brief update on that. I don't want to digress too much. Go sure, through you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Um, we are essentially where we were uh, when this pandemic started. Um, we had been in the planning stages. We had updated the plan. I think the mayor had anticipated being before you uh, in the spring, perhaps. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, so we're looking towards either the fall 2020 or first quarter of 2021 uh, to get the plan before you. Uh, it seems like every time we try to move on this, uh, something gets in the way. Uh, but we are still planning on having a plan before the body. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Al. Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thanks, Councilor. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Phelan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, I guess it would be to Paul. I got a question on the recycling materials. Um, I remember in the day when, when recycling first started, I happened to be on the council. And one of the things was we took plastic bottles one, two, three. We didn't take anything else. Recently, when we went to wall and one, now everything go, kind of goes in. And having watched a couple of things on uh, PBS about the plastic problem and all that, it kind of comes into maybe we weren't wrong in the beginning when we were only taking those, but I guess, is there any, is there any way we could maybe educate people on that? So we're not, so we actually take materials that can be recycled because most of the stuff you have can't be recycled. Those, that plastic cookie thing, it has a recycle symbol, doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't recycle, but a, a, a bottle with the one, two or three might actually recycle. So I guess, um, I, I don't know how you would do it, but uh, I guess if you have any thoughts on that, if uh, there was any way to mix that in as part of it, maybe an education process of people. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak to that, Councilor. Um, yes, we, we do have plans to, uh, to um, start uh, in education. Uh, we, we actually got some grants to do, um, to do this type of thing for education to uh, we to actually we could hire people to go out and and uh, and uh, put stickers on barrels if we if we're finding people are, are not they actually they actually inspect um, recycle bins and if they see people putting improper materials in they, they put uh, some kind of a sticker on or some kind of a, a, a notice educating the people um, so there is a there is a plan and it's um. Part of it comes out of the state, so we're, we're looking at that now, how to um, set this in motion. But it, 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 it's definitely on our radar. Okay, thank you, because I know uh, we got very used to throwing just about anything in there, and there is some limited th things that are actually recyclable that would, would be processed, but because everything now has a recycle button on it, which is a, a mistake by the industry, I believe. But um, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think that will be, uh, I don't want to make it seem like recycling isn't a good idea because it's costing us some money. It is a very good idea, but sometimes it's what you recycle that, uh, that can cause the problem. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any more questions on collection and disposal? Council Mahoney? I just wanted to check in quickly and just ask this question. I know that we do have a composting kind of subcommittee that's uh, it's been looking into things. 
Um, and they, they did get some progress happening right before we went into this COVID-19. I was just wondering if there's any um, discussions about that maybe for the future. I, I can handle that uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. We did have a, a, a meeting now to stretch my memory, Counselor, because it, it was pre-COVID. Um, we believe we like getting, <laughs> I know. Um, I believe we are anticipating a set of recommendations from, from the group mm -hmm. um, with some potential options. I know there's a, a, an offshoot of that group working with the school department, mm -hmm. uh, developing perhaps a pilot program in the, within the school system. That may be one of the recommendations that comes out of it. And there's also been some movement relative to a pilot program uh, within the city itself. Um, and again, this was a meeting I think we took maybe February um, relative to investigating it a little further. Um, so essentially, I would I would I think we're still waiting on the final set of recommendations from the task force. I actually have a meeting next week. Uh, with the folks, some of those folks that were on that task force, and that'll be a subject that, that we'll dive back into, Council. Yeah, I'm just bringing that up just because recyclables obviously are, um, it, they're going to only get more expensive. This isn't something, this isn't something new, and it's going to be something that we're going to be constantly dealing with. And the same thing with obviously um, the amount of trash that we're having picked up, and recycles just be able to offset that. And comp composting is something that's working in other communities. I know we are working on that. So I just want to give a shout out to that committee and um, just hopefully that will be something that we can move forward with and, and find another way to um, bring this budget back in line. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Councilor. You. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, motion Mr. approved. Motion to approve by Councilor Kane. Uh, on the motion. Nothing more. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, uh, Paul and, and Al, for that uh, explanation on uh, collection and disposal. Um, drain department, uh, Mr. Grazioso. Yeah, the drain budget decreased by 31989 Seven positions were reallocated, 40-40-20 uh, between water, sewer, drain which reduced the personal services line by 35,652. A general foreman position was added, which increased the budget by 26,618. Additional cuts to overtime, travel allowance, and police details resulted in a net decrease of 16,989 to personal services. And I would welcome any questions. Chair recognizes President Liang. Yeah, I want to make a motion to approve, but I also just want to um, take a moment to call you out, Alan. Thank you, because, you know, when we go through this and we see, um, you know, items that aren't being spent and some decreases that could potentially happen based off of historic spending, you cut significantly the video technician line, um, as well as the travel allowance based off of previous spending. And I just wanted to, you know, again, just take a moment and thank you for doing so and um, being so mindful about that coming into this year. So uh, thanks, Al, and motion to approve. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Motion on the floor to approve. Uh, on the motion, seeing no more conversation. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. Thanks, Al. We'll move on to the uh, sewer enterprise. Okay. Um, before we get started, I just want to, there's a little housekeeping. I um, want to let you know that the debt service lines and the water sewer budgets based on the new refinancing program uh, we've qualified for related to our MWRA capital loans. Um, this program will provide flexibility in our annual debt service payments for uh, approved capital budgets. We found out yesterday from the MWRA that that does require the council to sign off on the refinancing. Um, so we'll have, we will have those orders for you for the meeting on June 15th. So, Al, that's a uh, a program that really doesn't change any of the numbers, but puts us on a new a new schedule that probably might be beneficial to the city. Yes, definitely beneficial to the city. Okay. Uh, do you want to um, go so, over this or yeah, so, so a little bit, and then I'll go back and and, and see if we have any questions. Sure. So, so the sewer enterprise fund decreased by seven hundred eighteen thousand one eighty-seven, on uh, two point seven two uh, 
year over year. Uh, the enterprise fund was able to take advantage of the uh, debt service deferral opportunity uh, provided by the MWRA. Uh, the result was a debt service reduction of 443,532. Um, Additionally, the MWRA sewer assessment decreased by 308,934. Um, personnel services increased 52,813 and contractual services decreased by 75,000. Thank you, Al. Any questions on the sewer enterprise for Commissioner Grazioso? Chair recognizes President Liang. Here, um, I apologize, I had to step away at the beginning of this, so if you already addressed it, just let me know. But there's two items um, here that had gone up significantly. One is the project manager line that was created for 16,800, and then the general foreman line went from 26 to 53. Can you just let me know what the increases are for? Yeah, the, the, uh, the project manager, uh, resident liaison, that was the position I talked about that was five ways out of uh, when we talked about the engineering, Mr. Kintercross. So that was, um, that that was, again, that was part of that um, five-way split. Okay, and then the general foreman one? Uh, let me just see. The general foreman was one that we, we created a general foreman position in, 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 in the, in the for water sewer drain, um, we wanted uh, it's paid three ways, and it's it's to give us it gives us a little more um, uh, how do I say it? It, accountability. it? Yeah, accountability for the drain drain in MS4, which is um, a critical area now. Um, it, it takes a lot of the pressure off the other general foreman who was trying to manage three departments water, sewer, and drain. So we felt it was a, a pretty important uh, thing to do. Drain is, um, even though it's split three ways, but drain is, uh, right now, we probably have more calls on drainage issues and uh, more going on in that area than uh, than, uh, than we'd like. But it's uh, it's a very critical area right now, so. No, I, I completely agree. And let us take this moment to do a quick PSA to not flush um, disposable wipes, please. And I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Okay. Thanks, Counselor. Uh, any other questions on this department? I have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. On the motion, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. And the yeah. last one, Al, Water yeah, Enterprise. Right. Water Enterprise. Uh, we decreased that budget by $901,711. Um, again, we took advantage of the debt service deferral opportunity by the MWRA. Um, the re result was a debt service reduction of 1.5 million, 1.537273. Uh, and then additional uh, Personal services increased by just thirteen thousand seventeen dollars, and contractual services decreased by sixty three thousand nine sixty eight. So the total um, budget decrease was nine hundred one thousand seven hundred eleven dollars. Motion approved. Motion made by Councillor Kane on the motion. Presently, Ang. Thank you, Al. Just one question on the line item under contractual services for the animal pest control. Um, historically, this line item hasn't been used. So could you just explain to me what it's for and if it's going to be used for this fiscal year and next fiscal year? Well, I think if you look last year, um, we spent all of that. Um, this year, one of the things we did this year, um, we tried to incorporate uh, greater pest control within our contracts. Um, for instance, uh, our road work contracts. Um, so, you know, water, sewer, seawall. But uh, that being said, um, we're concerned about, um, we're seeing a little bit of a jump as we're doing uh, the seawall project. 
down to that. I'm sure we are a little bit nervous about as we rip these walls out, we're going to see more rodents. And uh, so we want to make sure that we have the means to uh, deal with those issues that may come up. Okay. That makes sense. I appreciate it. I just wanted some clarification on it. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, President. Uh, Chair recognizes Mrs. Mahoney. Thank you. Um, Al, I just have a quick question. It's less about your budget and more about when you set the rates for water. I mean, we have a drop in our um, our estimates here. I'm just curious to know how that works because obviously people are um, always very sensitive about their water bills. So it's just curious to know what the, how that process works. Well, I'm going to let Paul Delababa speak to that, Counselor. Sure. Counselor, how are you? Very good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Okay, so you know, right now, you know, looking at the numbers and um, seeing the, the, you know, the, the drops in the budget, you know, it is encouraging to take a look at it. But we, I really can't even provide a rate recommendation at this point until right. we the, the the budgets have been approved. And, um, you know, we have our indirect and direct expenses calculated off the citywide budgets. And, um, you know, at that point, we'll be able to provide the rate recommendation to the mayor. But right now, it, it's looking good uh, mm -hmm. because obviously our revenue requirement is is not as high as it was last year. Right. And the reason why I'm asking that, when does that get set? Just so I so I do get asked. This is one question I get asked all the time because, you know, water is expensive so you know when did when do you like we know when the tax taxes for um we set the tax rate in the fall is the water rate similar in that time frame or well yes yeah. so well the water rates are set july 1st um okay. and we're required by law to advertise those rates um two weeks prior to that uh, so you'll see in the coming weeks you know mid-june uh we'll be running a legal ad in the quincy sun okay i just wanted to ask um just so that that it can be um you know, you can say it out loud, and anybody that's listening can can hear it. So I appreciate that very much, and um, I hope it. I hope that too stays um, level if it goes down. Thanks. That's right, Cole. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Councillor Harris. Good morning, uh, Chairman. Um, I want to just uh, reach out and say to. Uh, Al um, and, his, and his group. Um, I always ask for uh, uh, things and sometimes there's a little tug of war, but um, in the long run, um, you've helped me as many of the other department heads have. And um, I truly uh, appreciate uh, everything that you folks do. And, um, and I, I, of course, uh, support this, uh, this section of the budget. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Chair recognizes Councillor Palmucci. Yeah, I just want to say, just just a quick warning, Al. When the guys are out mowing the lawns today, make sure they don't run over Councillor Harris. Move approval. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not even going to comment on that one, Councillor. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. They don't go down my street anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Motion made by Council Palmucci. Uh, on the motion, Council DeBona. You're muted, Noel. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on mute. I'm, I'm muted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quick on um, com, Commissioner Gracioso, I just want to thank your whole entire uh, team for every on all the work you've been doing. One thing about Al that's when he's come on that I I've known from other departments he's been in is he's he's got a great eye and attention to detail. Let me tell you, and being a being a landscaper, and you got to be able to see things that the average eye does not see. And you you're very very good at it. So um, I just I'm I'm happy that you put a fine comb under your budget. And um, if there's areas that you don't think you need, you you take them out or you decrease them. And um, I just want to thank all thank you for all your hard work out there. Um, drive around the city and just see all your crews out there doing a great job. And thank you so much. Um, motion to approve or um, accepted all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Council. We get a motion by Council Palmucci on the motion. I don't see any more conversation. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Oz, no, and that's it. Thank you. Passes. Thank you. Um, thanks, Al. Nice and Al. Nice, nice job uh, with the cuts and and as my colleague said, with with all the work that gets done um, and the response, uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Councillors. Have a good day. Thanks, Al. So this uh, kind of brings us to the end, but we'll have to have, to have one more session. Um, my notes from last night uh, indicate we still need a good answer on the Furnace Brook question, and we need a good answer on the health insurance question that Councillor Palmucci brought up. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Walker this morning. My thought is after conferring a little bit back and forth with uh, Councillor um, President Liang was to uh, look to have Mr. Walker and company uh, do some homework over the next yeah. couple of weeks and we'll set up a uh, Zoom meeting on the 15th, uh, public hearing from 6 to 6.05, and then a uh, finance committee meeting starting at 6.05, and hopefully we can start our regular meeting at seven. That's what we tentatively threw together uh, in the last couple of minutes. That'll give plenty of time for answers on those two, on those two questions that I think with the two uh, numbers questions that we had. I know that we also asked uh, for some information to come back from Alex Lehman. I'll work with him. Um, other than that, if anybody has any comments, I will close this out right now. We will wait to have those meetings, um, make the approval in subcommittee and bring it to the council that night and approve the budget, hopefully. Uh, so I will, um, I will leave us right now and adjourn at uh, 11.22. And I want to thank everybody. It, it went okay. pretty good. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Good day. Bye-bye.